Today we're going to pick up on the subject of theology, as we have said before, for those who may be just entering into this uh, class. Theology is really two words, the word ology, O-L-O-G-Y. You see that on the, suff on the end of a lot of words, which really refers to the study of. Theo uh, is the, uh, the first part that deals with God. So when you look at the word theology, you're looking at the words of or the, the name pertaining to the study of God. Now, I believe a lot of people need to understand God. Uh, I believe if you're going to be any kind of teacher or any kind of preacher or, or being able to share your faith in what you believe, you need to understand God. You need to understand who God is and what God has done and what he's provided for you. Uh, this goes back to a story I've told before. We went into a place, we were in the Islamic mosque, and we had opportunity to talk about, uh, you know, it, we were interviewed actually, we went into this session uh, of this mosque in the inner cities of Chicago. And so we observed on an inner city mission trip, we observed them praying. And after we observed them praying, we went up to this big conference room, and the leaders of the mosque sat down, and they wanted a question and answer time. But most of it was, it was to show us that we're wrong, our Bible was wrong, and how they're right in different things. Uh, but what bothered me during that time was not that they wanted to prove their self right. They have the right to do that. What bothered me is I had a group of people of 19, and very few could even support what they believed. Well, this is why we believe it. And they asked why. This is what we believe. Why? Well, you know the Bible says Where? Uh, how do you know? And and so what it did, it made them look like, you know, we just we just shoot off the top of our heads and we don't have any foundation base for what we really believe. So we went back that night and we debriefed and I was very agitated, very agitated, not because just of teenagers, which was there. It was just some of the adults just agitated. And I made us I made a commitment right then. I'm never going to allow somebody else to tell me or to make me feel like they know more about their God and what they believe than I do my God and what I believe. And I'm going to settle that in my heart. And so this is not just a college term theology, and I know we're using it based upon that, but it's us having a knowledge of God. And since there's not one single paragraph or one single sentence or one word that you can give to describe God and what God does and uh, who God is, we have a we have several names that are defining names of God, and we have already talked about before the uh, six defining names of God, which is Elohim, which was El Elyon, El Olam, and El Shaddai, Adonai, and just Jehovah. And But now we're going to go into what, what is looked at in the study as the redemptive names of God, and we're going to look at a nine of the redemptive names of God. So uh, I want to read a verse to go into this. The first name that I'm going to look at is uh, we talked about under the defining names, Elohim, which is the only true and living God, or which I like to call the God of the Creator. So the first one, we start looking at the name Jehovah. Uh, when you start looking at the name Jehovah, that just becomes a part of the great supreme judge. Uh, we referred to it before when Abraham met God at the burning bush and he said, I'm going to send you back to Egypt and all these things. Uh, Abraham said, or Abram I mean, Moses said, sorry, I'm getting my Abraham and Moses mixed up here. Moses said at the burning bush, uh, who am I going to say that sent me? And he says, you're going to tell him that I am. Now, when he said I am, that sealed it all. When you look at God saying I am, I am what? I am anything you need me to be. Or whoever you need me to be. So when you look at this Jehovah, uh, this defining name, the word Jehovah, and then you put it with the other word Elohim, the first name I want to look at is Jehovah Elohim, the Lord our Creator. In Genesis chapter 2, in Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 4, and these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth. When they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and made heaven. And so this is when the Lord God made this. And when I look at this, God is Jehovah Elohim. He is the one that created it all. 
You know, there's a lot of different subjects, a lot of different people look at things like, you know, do you believe in evolution? Do you believe in creation? Do you believe in the Big Bang? Do you believe in this and that? The truth is, God is the creator of all things. He is creator. He is Jehovah Elohim. And uh, he set up laws of creation. And we understand, uh, if you just look at, you look at nature itself, the Bible declares that even the nature, even nature will declare the greatness of God and uh, who God is. And so we look at this, that, that he is Jehovah Elohim. He is the Lord, our creator. He's the one who, who set up and created us. If we're going to, where he says, be fruitful and multiply, that men or everything is created after its own kind. A man and a woman, uh, they are married, they, they're, they're together, and they, they create their offspring. And so God is the God of all creation when it comes to that. He's the one, uh, when, he had, when he told Adam and Eve, you be fruitful and multiply. You know, some people get the mentality that that could not have happened in the garden. You know, it's as if they had to sin and get into sin before they could be fruitful and multiply. You know, well, how could they do that? You know, they couldn't even see themselves naked in the garden. But God created it for them to live in this environment called Eden. And within that environment, they had the right. You know, we look at a garden. Well, what if the garden was too small? I mean, the, the, the whole area was Eden. I mean, it was the garden of God. And so right within that garden, they had the right to be fruitful and to multiply. And everything will multiply or give birth after its own kind. And so God, in, God intended really for that to happen. So I want to base some things off of this, that he is Jehovah Elohim. He is the Lord, our creator. I'm going to get through this a little bit quicker than the last time because uh, I want to really get through uh, the uh, redemptive names of God. Number two, one that we all enjoy, turn to Genesis chapter 22. I want us to get the verses and just telling people the verse. Genesis chapter 22, one of my... Uh, favorite stories here because uh, I love the story of Abraham. I almost got ahead of myself instead of Moses a while ago, talking about Abraham. The uh, second redemptive name, those names that reveal God's help for mankind. These are the names that reveal God's help or the redemptive names. This is what we, this is where we get the names uh, that we're going to be lo looking at. Uh, so uh, Jehovah Elohim, the name identifies Jehovah with the creation of all things. Now, the next one we're going to talk about is very familiar with you. It's called Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. J I R E H. Jehovah Jireh. Now, we understand that by just some of the music and songs that people say. If you ask somebody about Jehovah Jireh, they just say, Who is he? He's the Lord, our provider. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. So when you look at this, the Lord, our provider. Now, when you understand where it came from, you remember God had a covenant or made a covenant with Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, God told Abraham, come out of his land and leave his kinfolk behind and his country behind. I'm going to take you to a country and a land that you've never been. You, know, you don't know anything about it. And so Abraham left in Genesis chapter 12, and there he took with him his nephew named Lot. Now, I believe God's intention was for him to leave Lot back also, but he was so obligated by culture to take Lot with him. So God began to bless Abraham, and Abraham became a great man with great substance and great flocks. And, and because of that, Lot also became a blessed man with, with flocks and uh, servants and different things. And uh, the land became small because they became great. And Lot's herdsmen and Abraham's herdsmen became uh, there, there, there became a conflict between them. And so Abram, before he was Abraham at the time, Abram being a man of peace, he said, uh, it's time that we divide. You pick your direction. Abraham, Abram didn't just say, uh, I'm going to take the best and you can have the rest. Uh, Abram said, Lot, uh, let's don't do this. We're family. You pick your direction and, and I'll just go from there. So Lot looked, looked around and he saw the plains towards Sodom and the, and the lush grass and the grazing fields. And he said, I'll take that direction. So Abraham was going to say, all right, be blessed. You go ahead and do that. And so when it was all said and done, God told Abram, you know, look to the north, south, east, and the west. For everything you see, that's going to be yours. 
See, God told Abram that he was going to be the father of many nations, and, and God was going to bless him, and he was going to be fruitful. The problem was his wife Sarah was barren. Not because she was in her 90s. She was barren from the time she was able or old enough to give birth. And so they never had a son. And so Abraham's always living with this. I'm going to be the father of many nations, and I have a wife that can't even give birth. And so uh, Abraham's pretty upset and bothered by this. And then you go f to chapter 15 of Genesis, and I'll just give you a rundown. Uh, God began to deal with Abraham about you're going to, be, you're going to have a son, and, and you're going to be blessed. And he said, how can this be? I only have one in my household, this Eliezer of Damascus, and, and uh, he's not my own. And God says, no, he's not going to be the one, but you and Sarah are going to have a son. And uh, then you're going to be the father of many nations. And so... Abraham makes this statement, Abram still at the time, uh, Abram makes a statement, how can this be? You know, he's looking at it, how can this be? So God calls him to go into a deep sleep, and this is where we uh, get a lot of teaching from the blood covenant from it. And while he was in this deep sleep, uh, before that, God said, you take a ram and you take these animals, and I want you to divide them down the middle. And if I get into reading that, we won't get any further than that. But you take these animals, you divide them down the middle. And then after he divided it, the blood was there. Abram, you know, eventually went into a sleep. And he saw a vision, uh, someone passing in between the pieces of that blood. The Bible says, because God could swear by no greater, he swore by himself when it came to Abraham. And God cut a covenant with Abraham and showed him through this blood covenant, which Abram knew it was the greatest covenant of all, a covenant made with blood. And there God established it. And... Uh, you know, I thought, if with that kind of encounter, how could you ever doubt God again? With that kind of visible encounter that God just cut a covenant with you based upon blood, how could you ever doubt? But chapter 16, we find that's when Abram married, uh, married Hagar, and then she conceived and had a son. And the son, they called him Ishmael when Abraham was 86 years old. You find that at the end of chapter 16. Thirteen years passed, and you'll find Abram again in chapter 17, verse 1. God comes to him, and what, and what we know as the last time we were together came to him and said, I am the Almighty God. That's the first time that God did not introduce himself back to Abram as Elohim or as the Creator. He introduced him as El Shaddai. And there he saw God as El Shaddai, and from 99 years old until the time he passed, the, according to the Scriptures, he never doubted God. And he was strong in faith. Well, still up to that point, Abram made a statement, Oh, that Ishmael may live, live before you forever. But God confirmed that you and Sarah will have this son. Well, we know Hebrews declares that Sarah by faith received strength in herself to conceive seed and to give birth of a son. So Sarah eventually got into faith to receive seed and to give birth. And so we see God working on her part as well. Now, now we go to a place to where eventually Sarah gives birth to Isaac. Kind of fast forward this story. And after he gives birth to, after she gives birth to Isaac, Isaac becomes the promised son. The Bible says Isaac was the son of promise. Ishmael was the son of the flesh. And so Isaac becomes the promised son in this deal. And now God is ready to tell, tell Abraham. He's Abraham now. He became Abraham in chapter 17. He takes Abraham and he said, you take Isaac up to the mountain. And there you're going to offer a sacrifice for him. So this is the story that we're getting up to. And it came to pass, verse 1, after these things that God did tempt or test Abram and said unto him, Abram, he said, Behold, here am I. He said, Take now thy son, thine only son. Now, uh, was, was Isaac his only son? No, he had another son, Ishmael, but God's looking at the covenant promise. Within this, there's only one son, only one son of promise. Take now thy son, thy only son, whom thou lovest, and get into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering unto one of the mount, upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you. So they rose early in the morning, and they took, they took you know, the supplies they needed, and they get to the mountain. You can read this later, and I'm just going to share with you. They get to the mountain, and, and Abraham puts the wood up on Isaac, and so they walk up this mountain. And Isaac understands, now you got to understand, before Isaac was born, Abraham really, where it says Abraham was strong in faith, he never wavered. 
That's after he was 99 years old. Up to that time, Abraham did waver in his faith. If he didn't, would never be an Ishmael, there'd never be a Hagar, and different things that happened. But you got to look at Isaac. Isaac didn't know his daddy before 99 years old. Isaac didn't know him as running to Egypt, you know, and trying to find during the time of drought. And when God told him to be at a certain place, Isaac didn't know him as that. Isaac only knew his father after his father was introduced to the God of El Shaddai, who never wavered, whose faith was strong in God, never doubted. And that's all he ever known his father to be. So when he laid the wood up on his son's back, his son wouldn't question him because all he ever saw his father was right on with God. And now they get to this mountain, and uh, Isaac says, Father, here's the wood, and here's the altar. Where is the sacrifice? And he says, uh, Son, the Lord will provide. So now look at verse 14, uh, or just look at verse 10. Uh, let's look at verse 10 for, through 14 of chapter 22. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Now I believe because Abraham did this, was willing to sacrifice his son, his only son, now, God was going to keep his part of the covenant, and God was going to send his son, his only son, and allow him to die for us all. Uh, then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, verse 13, Abraham looked at, li lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, or behind him, a ram caught into the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And so this is the place where God provided. God provided the sacrifice. And let me tell you, he's still Jehovah-Jireh for us because God gave his only begotten son who died in our place because we're the one deserved hell. God gave his only begotten son who died in our stead. And therefore, he wasn't just Jehovah-Jireh to Abraham. He's Jehovah-Jireh to us. He redeemed our life. He is Jehovah-Jireh. You could just stay the whole session just on this right here. Because you could see Jehovah-Jireh throughout all of this. And so we find here is Jehovah-Jireh. The next one I truly love is the third name of the redemptive names of God, those names that reveal God's help and God's deliverance, is Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. The Lord, our, our healer. He healer. Exodus chapter 15. Uh, I've quoted this in services many times. Exodus chapter 15. And uh, we're going to see here 1526. 15 verse 26 here. He said, and, uh, and God said, If thou wilt diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear unto his commandment, commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of these diseases. Now this I will put none, as if God will put some on some. Or in essence, I, like, I got it written inside of my Bible. I will not allow any of these diseases upon thee which I have brought up on or allowed upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now, he is our healer. He's not going to be our healer. He is our healer. He is the Lord that heals us. I've mentioned uh, many times before that there's different denominations that different people believe that uh, healing came in with the apostles and healing left with the apostles. But God was Jehovah Rapha before the first apostle was ever thought about upon the face of the earth. He was their healer. But the stipulation was, if you obey my word and keep my commandments and you diligently seek after me, I will take sickness away from the midst of you and the number of your days I will fulfill. For I am the Lord, your healer. Now, every time they walked with God, healing was always available to them. 
even when they sinned and serpents came out to get them. And he said, take a serpent and put it up on. You take a bronze serpent, you put it up on a pole, and whoever looks upon that, I will bring healing back to the people. And, and you see that God was a God of healing throughout the whole Old Testament to his people. Isaiah 53, 5, uh, the, the prophet said he was wounded, talking about the coming of Christ and, and the healer uh, that we know is Jesus Christ. Uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. Our peace is upon him. And by his stripes, we were healed. We were healed. Now, uh, Isaiah says we are healed. 1 Peter 24 says we were. Uh, I had a pastor friend I preached for one time, and he had a, he had a, a Hebrew Bible. And when he read that, he read this Isaiah 53, 5. He says, you know how we look at, because this guy that was a Hebrew man that gave it to him, he says, you know how we always quote Isaiah 53, 5 says, by his stripes you are healed. And 1 Peter 2, 24 said, uh, by his stripes you were healed. He says, uh, we're looking at Peter saying, quoting Isaiah and say, you were healed. But he showed me there in that Hebrew Bible that actually Isaiah 53, 5 says, by his stripes you were healed. And we, I believe that because I was teaching on before the foundation of the world, God had already established everything. So in God's eyes, when the prophet prophesied, God had already established it before the foundation of the world. So Peter wasn't quoting, referring back to Isaiah. Peter was actually referring back to what God was saying before the foundation of the world. And so by his stripes you were healed. That's what it actually happened in Isaiah. And Peter saying the same thing, by his stripes you were healed. Amen. And so when you look at this, he is Jehovah, he is Jehovah Rapha. Now there's another verse in the New Testament that I do want to read, which is Matthew chapter, um, chapter 8. Uh, this is one of my favorite verses that if a sickness tries to get a hold of me, I go to this verse here because it brings so much life to me. Uh, you know, we always can run to Isaiah, but this is the Isaiah scripture that referred to out of Matthew chapter 17. Matthew, uh, I think here, Matthew chapter uh, 8. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 8, verse uh, 17. It said that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord, our healer. One that is not talked about a lot out of the uh, names of God is Jehovah Nisi. The Lord our banner, the Lord our victory. Now when you look at this, the Israelites had just been victorious in the battle with Amalekite or Amalek. Aaron and Hur held up the hands of Moses until sunset. And while they, while they did, so Israel prevailed. Now this is a story that uh, when they were fighting uh, Amalek, uh, Moses was there holding up, the, uh, you know, holding up his uh, staff. And, and while Moses' hands were held up, uh, Israel prevailed when Moses' hands got tired and went down. Israel was being defeated. And so Aaron and Hur came and took the hands of Moses and lifted them up, and it, which it shows that uh, they supported the man of God. And, and they're the ones who kept his hands lifted up because as long as his hands were lifted up, uh, God's people prevailed. And there's a lot of things to be, there's a lot of thing to be said about that uh, to support you know the pastor the the, the leader uh, if his hands get down and he gets weary and gets down it affects the whole move and so uh, Aaron and Hur lifted up the hands of Moses and held them up and while the hands of Moses were lifted up God's people prevailed and so this came to a place where it says the Lord our banner our victory. And uh, that's in Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. He is the Lord, our banner. And so uh, uh, we are thankful that 
that he's there all the time. And he's going to be there with us all the way to the end. Let's just read that, Exodus 17. And let's just read 8 through 15. Exodus 17, you should be pretty much there anyway, uh, where we were talking at. Exodus 17, uh, verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men to go out and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will send... I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. He stood there and they put a stone under him. So that he could rest. You want to talk about uh, people standing with the man of God here. So they put a stone under him uh, so that he could rest. And he sat there upon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands. The one, on, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for memorial in the book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Write it in the book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah, Jehovah Nisi. And so this was the banner that he built. So when you see these names of God, how God delivered them, how God redeemed them from that, and how can you describe God and what God's going to do? They watched God's power. As Moses was getting weary, they put a stone underneath of him. And then as Aaron Hur held up his hands while Joshua was fighting the battle and wanted to rehearse this in the ears of Joshua, the great things that happened. So when it was all said and done, they built an altar and worshiped God and honored God and said, truly, he's not just Jehovah, he's Jehovah Nisi, he's our banner. He's the one over us. He, it's, a, it's, a God of, it's a God of victory. They, I mean, God is the banner that we wave. He is our victory. And, you know, years ago, the names of God, people used to say that, use the names of God all the time. Jehovah Nisi, our banner. And, and uh, you know, people used to have all kind of banners. But it's not just making up a, a banner of cloth. It's God waving himself as I am your banner. I'm the one who waved over this battlefield. And brought victory into your life. This, this just kind of stirs me up. That we just see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But I'm telling you what. He is Jehovah Elohim. He is the, the God that's more than enough. He, he is I am that I am the creator. I am that I am the provider. I am the healer. I am your banner, your victory. And one of my favorites... One of my favorites is this one called Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. This word shalom comes from the word, uh, the, you get the word peace out of the word shalom. It's the covenant of God's peace. And, uh, and then you, you, find, you find the story in the book of Judges. When Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord... And named it the Lord of Peace. Gideon built an, an altar there and named it the Lord of Peace. Jehovah was peace to them even before the battle began. Shalom, peace, means more than freedom from conflict. The battle that Gideon had. More than freedom from conflict, it means prosperity, health, well-being, faith, faith in the face of conflict. Now, in the face of conflict, now, you know, I use the word the covenant of God's peace. The word peace means shalom, or shalom, we get the word peace. It's the word health, it's provision, it's prosperity. It denotes complete freedom. I say, to me, it's everything that redeems us from the curse of the law. Now, in the face of conflict, when Gideon was in this battle, in the face of conflict, he knew that God was the God, or Jehovah Shalom. 
he had peace in the midst of his battle. And so God wants us to have this covenant of shalom. This He wants to be Jehovah Shalom or our peace. Not just that, you know, Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. My peace I leave, I, I leave with you. Not as the world gives. I, I got something that the world don't have. But I have a greater peace that's going to be forever. One of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. I told you when I was in Israel uh, last year, I, uh, I had a ring made. They made it too small, so I don't wear it. And engraved in it, it's not engraved, it's actually cut out of the silver. It's not engraved and it's actually notched out where you can see my skin through it. It's written in Hebrew, Isaiah 54.10. Isaiah 54.10 is the verse that denotes the covenant of God's peace. The covenant of wholeness. God had a covenant with them because he was Jehovah Shalom. He had the right to make this covenant. And this covenant states that my people will be at full peace, full safety. I will preserve them. I will give them rest. And everything they need, it will be in the fullness of that. So he is Jehovah Shalom. If, 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 you, if you look at this, it's tied with righteousness. It's tied with redemption. That's why it's part of the redemptive names. And it is Jehovah Shalom. Shalom. Uh, mo moving on down, go with me to Psalms 23. This is a psalm we all know. You could probably quote it, right? The Lord is my, I shall not, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The next one after, after uh, Jehovah Shalom is Jehovah Rohi, or some people call it Jehovah Ra. The Lord is my shepherd. He is Jehovah. The Lord is my shepherd. And so when he says here in 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So that tells me when he's your shepherd, he's, he's the God that I am. Uh, not only is he a shepherd, but uh, he's a shepherd that puts his people in a state of not needing anything. Notice, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That means that God provided for his wants. No, you notice it didn't say the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not need. You know, people say, well, God's only obligated to take care of your need. My God should supply all your need, not needs, it's singular. My God should supply all of your need. And people get this thing that uh, it's all about need. Uh, God's never required to give you your wants. It's all about your needs. You ever heard that? But I'm thinking Jehovah Rahi, the Lord is my shepherd. The first thing he said that got him into that, the Lord is my shepherd. He's Jehovah Rahi. He says, uh, I shall not want. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he's with me. His rod, his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely... Surely, not, a, not maybe, surely his goodness and his mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in his house forever. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. See, God's not only, when he went to Israel, now, now when he went to Israel while they were in Egypt, when he went there and he delivered them out, notice when he delivered them, they went to the houses of the Egyptians and borrowed all of their wealth when they got into the wilderness I mean God was a God to them that they they didn't have want I mean they didn't even have need God provided it they had need of they wanted meat did God give them meat absolutely I mean there are just some things that God just just did uh, 
here's one that I don't want to get too far off of this. We need to get through it. I like Psalms 34 very well myself. I like Psalms 34 of verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. There is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack. They they may go days without finding their prey. Young lions lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come on. God's God's not penalizing you because you have wants. He just don't want you to lust after things that's going to hurt you. You know, a lot of people's wants are heaping treasures to themselves. They have nothing in there. It's all about the heart attitude. It's all about the heart attitude. Amen? Heart attitude. So Jehovah Rahi, the Lord, our shepherd. Ready for the next one? Jehovah Sidkenu. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Oh, I, I just, I mean, where, where can you go from there? The Lord, our righteousness. Jeremiah 23. Let's look at it from the Old Testament because that's what we're referring to him is this Old Testament, uh, how, how we describe him there. Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. Six. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. And in, in, in my Bible, it's all bold letters. That's all caps right there. The Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Sidkenu. I think I'm saying that right. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. You know the uh, New Testament. Uh, let me give you some verses over there because I love I love it myself. In uh, 1 Corinthians one thirty, 1 Corinthians one thirty. I'm going to read that because I just read this the other day. It's just something that I've always enjoyed. In the uh, chapter one of 1 Corinthians, it says, uh, "But of him are ye in Christ Jesus." Who of God, talking about Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom? He's made unto us righteousness. He's made unto us sanctification and redemption. See, these we're talking about the redemptive names of God. He's been made unto us all of these things. This is what he is. He's been made unto us. He's made unto us righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. God is our righteousness. He is Jehovah Sidkenu. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things shall be added unto you. Why? Because he's Jehovah Rahi also. He's your shepherd. You shall not want. I mean, this ought to just get you stirred up. There, I mean, this ought to be faith-building talk to you. And uh, things that we understand and things that we do. Things that we understand and things that we do. Jehovah, the next one, Jehovah Sabbath. The Lord, our King of glory. The Lord, our King of glory. The Lord of hosts, Jehovah Shabbat. He is the King of glory. Hallelujah. The King of glory. Not just the King of your problems. He's the King of glory. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. You know, kings rule, they're rich. And even talks about the riches of his glory. He is the king. Psalms 24. uh, No, I'm sorry. Uh, Yeah, Psalms 24.10. We just read Psalms 23. uh, Just a second ago. Psalms 24. That's a great psalm to read also, 24 and 25. Psalms 25, as you know, it's one of my favorites. 
uh, 24 is kind of sandwiched in between there. Look at verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. I think I'll just read that again. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. The King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up, lift up your heads, all you gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. The King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Now, you know, try to write a paragraph to, to explain that. He is the King of glory. Isn't that awesome? The King of glory. And so you'll see people that know him as that way. We're going to get one more in here. Jehovah Shammah. Number nine out of the redemptive names of God. Jehovah Shammah. The Lord who is very present. Now we, we even know that, that God is a very present help in a time of need. The Lord is present. Exodus 40, verse 35. Exodus 48, verse 35. You can read those, but God's always present. You know what breaks my heart is people feeling all alone. How am I going to get out of this? How are we going to survive this? What are we going to do to uh, escape this problem? Shama. He's present. When you wake up in the morning and you feel all alone, you can just say, Jehovah Shama, he's present with me. You know, certain times of, of the year, it seems like you deal with more people with depression, being oppressed. And you know why they get that way? Because they, they're hopeless. There's nothing there that they can find to bring life to them. Nothing there that they can find to bring victory to them. But the truth of the matter is, God wanted his people to know they're not left alone. I've never, the matter of fact, the Bible says, talking about Jesus, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Forsake you. He will always be present. He's a very present help. Now, you've got to understand, Jesus was God who came in the flesh, so he didn't quit being there. He didn't quit being all these things, these nine redemptive names, once Jesus came on the scene. I mean, Jesus was, was God in bodily form in this earth. He was the Godhead in bodily form. That's what the book of uh, Colossians says. And uh, it's good to know in the midst of trial, in the midst of temptation, in the midst of heartache, in the midst of struggle, he's still Jehovah Shammah, the Lord, our very, the Lord who is very present or our very present help, our God that's always there. I tell you, it got to the place to where he said, uh, if, you, if you obey me and be my people, you let me be your God, I will not only walk with you or be present with you, I'm going to be present in you. So we're not having to wait for God to show up to show his presence or to know that he's with us. He dwells in us. And people that are born again have such a presence of God. If we just learn to draw from this, and learn to allow God to just live big in us. And we know that God's with us everywhere we go. There's times I've been in the earlier years uh, uh, in Africa. I remember laying on that bed. Them not knowing if I was going to live or die. When that thing had tried to attack me. Uh, feeling all alone. Uh, the year that I was, in, you know, and God was present with me the whole time. The time I was in Tanzania when they tried to detain me at the airport. And wanted to arrest me and... And because I've overstayed my time there and, and uh, I couldn't get a telephone call out, no one knew that I was even in Tanzania at the time. And uh, one part of you is uh, fighting fear and everything else, anxiety. Uh, they wouldn't even let my other Kenya friend to be with me to help understand or, or let me explain to them what's going on. I stood there. I stood there. And God showed up. He was present with me. 
He redeemed me out of that. That's why these are redeeming names. He, his presence redeemed me out of that situation. So I realize we don't sit around and just say, uh, I need Jehovah Jireh. I need Jehovah Rapha. I need Jehovah Shalom. No, we just know that it's God. And all this is, it's understanding, getting a knowledge of God, who God is, and, and how God showed up and how God described himself in the lives of these people. And he will be everything. And it all goes back to this name Jehovah. Who is Jehovah? I am that I am. Well, how do we describe? How do we describe? Now, here's where it's all at. How do we describe I am that I am? I'm Jireh. I'm Rapha. I'm Sidkenu. I'm Shalom. I'm Roho. I am that I am healer. I am that I am deliverer. I am that I am shepherd. And he is to us today, tomorrow, and then forever. Amen. Lord bless you. Keep God first place in your life and keep moving forward. Amen.